There we go. Can everyone see that all right? Yep. Great. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Rory. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, explaining successful transitions to solar energy um, from fossil fuels among Middle Eastern and Northern African countries. Uh, the presentation will follow this structure. So I'll briefly talk about the problem, so which is climate change and the need to shift away from fossil fuels. Um, the solution, which is switching to solar energy, especially in Middle East and the Northern African countries. And then finally, I'll talk about how my research fits into that. So I always thought that the shift away from fossil fuels kind of needed to happen vaguely at some point in the future. Um, but this report really changed my mind on that. Um, and what it basically says is that there are swathes of oil and gas reserves still underground waiting to be extracted, but we have to leave most of them in the ground so we can't extract them or else we'll exceed two degrees climate change. So it's really, really puts a deadline on, on when we've got to shift away from fossil fuels. Um, and that's what's depicted in this graph here. So on the left hand bar, you can see the known fossil fuel reserves. And in the middle bar, you can see that we have to leave 68% of them uh, underground, so we can't burn them. Uh, and the green bar depicts the 32% that we can burn. It would be better if we could maintain global warming at 1.5 degrees, in which case we need to leave 85% of fossil fuels in the ground, and we can only burn about 15%. And that's depicted on the right-hand side. So we can see that here, if we remain reliant on fossil fuels, we will exceed two degrees global warming. And you might think two degrees, so what? I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but two degrees is the limit that's set out in the Paris Agreement, which you might have heard about, heard talked about in the news. And two degrees is basically the amount of uh, climate change that will lead to what has been described as catastrophic effects by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Now, I don't have time to go into the full IPCC report, and what they mean by catastrophic. But I don't really need to. I mean, we can kind of see in the news the effects of climate change. So in 2004, The Guardian's former science editor, uh, Tim Radford, basically said that we're still waiting to start feeling the effects of climate change in 2004, but by 2020, we'll start to see the effects. And you can't help but think he was, he's right looking at the news. I mean, on the left-hand picture here, we've got the bushfires in Australia, the middle picture, we've got the bleaching of the coral reefs as a result of their sea temperature rising. And then on the right hand side, we've got the glaciers melting, which is partly causing um, sea levels to rise. And even COVID-19 um, has been argued to be a product of climate change. Now, this isn't talked about much, but um, China in the past 20, 30 years has engaged in rapid deforestation and the unregulated sale of live animals from those areas. And environmentalists have been warning about how this increases the likelihood of a virus jumping from one of those animals to a human host. So there's always the probability there. But if you engage in this activity of selling live animals all together in one market, then it exponentially increases the risk of that virus jumping. And COVID-19 is the third coronavirus to have done this since 2000. Um, it just so happens to be the most recent and the most deadly one. And, and the IPCC report warns about this. It warns about the increasing threats of viruses and diseases and infections in the future. As global temperatures rise, more viruses that exist in the global south will rise up to the global north. One region that's been particularly affected by climate change is the MENA region. Now, MENA stands for Middle East and North Africa. So when you hear me say MENA, just think Middle East, North Africa. Uh, and this is a region that's particularly affected by droughts and famines, and they encourage large scale migration. Um, but the weather extremes also inflame conflicts in the area. Uh, there was a great presentation done in the first expertise series on climate change in March by a girl called Camilla, uh, and she talked about the link between ISIS and droughts. So how ISIS were recruiting people and farmers who had suffered from droughts. But even before that, um, in the period from 2010 to 2012, there were a series of uprisings for the Arab Spring, uh, some of which culminated in wars such as the Syrian war. Now, it's been argued and it was modelled that before the Arab Spring, people have said it was, it was largely predictable due to the rise in food prices. And the MENA region is particularly susceptible to rises in food prices because of the droughts in the area. So, so again, we can see kind of climate change effects having real human costs. 
Uh, and the Arab Spring led to, um, like I said, the war in Syria and the 2015 migration crisis. Uh, now, this had a massive effect on politics uh, in the UK and the EU. Um, all the images of, of migrants coming over really had an effect on the Brexit vote. So what we see is this is a cycle where the effects of climate change, so the refugee crisis in this instance, encourages um, political isolation in developed countries, so Brexit. Uh, but the issue is that political isolation is the opposite of what's needed to tackle climate change. We, you know, we need more cooperation and more treaties and more agreements. So we get this vicious circle where climate change has an effect and it encourages us, us to pursue political isolation in the developed world. And then that exacerbates climate change further. So all of this has happened and we're not even near two, uh, two degrees climate change at the moment. We're on about one degree to 1.1 degree, as you can see in this graph. So it's pretty clear that we don't want to exceed two degrees of global warming which means we can't remain reliant on fossil fuels. We're gonna to have to shift away from fossil fuels pretty soonish to stay under two degrees. Now, this is a mammoth task and my research only looks at one small part of this shift. It basically asks, can these MENA countries switch from fossil fuels to solar energy? Now, the MENA countries specifically are 35 countries um, depicted on this map and about half of all known fossil fuel reserves are in this region. Other, re other reasons to focus on the MENA region are that their economies are heavily reliant on fossil fuels to survive. So 67% of Saudi Arabia's government revenue comes from oil, it's 90% in Kuwait, and it's 86% in Qatar. Uh, so if the world does shift away from fossil fuels, there's a real risk that these economies might suffer. But the benefit is that they have a natural advantage in solar energy because of their position in the world and the amount of sunlight that they get there's a real opportunity for them to to get to specialize in solar energy other reasons to focus on them there's a young rapidly growing population who will need jobs and also there are immediate humanitarian challenges from the conflicts and the famine and the heat in the area as we've kind of seen recently with the israel palestine situation so these two tables depict some of the MENA countries uh, and the amount of solar infrastructure that they have developed. So you can see on the left-hand table, some of the countries that are doing well, Turkey, Israel, and Jordan. Some of the countries that are doing less well are on the right-hand side, Tunisia, Azerbaijan, and Afghanistan. Now I'm gonna pick out two countries in this presentation, uh, just cut sort of as random to talk about. Um, and I'm gonna depict one country that's doing quite well, which is Morocco, I'm gonna talk about Morocco, and then one country that's doing less well, which is Afghanistan. So as I mentioned, Morocco have been doing incredibly well. Um, they've developed 900, 980 gigawatts an hour of solar infrastructure as of 2019. Just for context, the average UK home uses about 0 0.0037 gigawatts an hour a year. Now, the, pro the average Moroccan home probably uses a lot less than that, but it's just helpful to get an example of, of the units we're talking about. So Morocco have done incredibly well. From, from 2007 to 2015, renewable energy has increased from less than 10% to about 30% of their total energy production. And part of that is because they're on the Atlantic, so they have um, a real, real advantage in wind energy, but also they've done really, really well in developing solar infrastructure. So this picture is of the Noor solar complex, uh, Noor being Arabic for light. And this thing is absolutely massive. It covers an area of about 4,700 football fields, uh, it costs about $2.5 billion to make, and it can provide energy for about a million homes. So it's seriously impressive stuff. Now we've got to ask, how has Morocco been able to achieve this? And I want to focus on, on two things really. Firstly, the political imperative to develop solar infrastructure is really strong in Morocco. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, Morocco doesn't actually have lots of fossil fuels itself. It's a net importer of fossil fuel energy. Um, so they have a real imperative to be no longer dependent on other countries and develop their own solar infrastructure. But also Morocco is very close to the EU, particularly close to Spain. So there's the opportunity for them to specialise in solar energy and export that to Europe. And all of that has meant that the king in Morocco has really heavily pushed 
um, for for the imperative towards solar. Suitable legislation has been established, institutions, and that's made life really easy for investors to just come in um, and invest in uh, in solar infrastructure, such as that North Solar Complex. The second thing I want to talk about is concessional financing. So infrastructure, as you can imagine, uh, requires a big upfront payment. It's only once it's completed, it starts paying back. Um, so if you were to borrow this money from a commercial source, um, it would make the project too expensive uh, and unprofitable because the interest rate on the money that you borrowed to build the infrastructure would be too high. So what can happen is international organizations, such as the World Bank, can loan the money at a cheaper concessional rate, so a rate that's cheaper than the commercial source. And that basically makes the project more affordable and allows it to go ahead. So a country that's been less successful, as I mentioned, is Afghanistan. Um, it can only produce about, about 37 gigawatts an hour of solar energy. And we shouldn't really be surprised by this because as compared to Morocco, Afghanistan's got a smaller economy, poorer electricity grid, higher corruption, more political risk, war and conflict, and a weaker currency. And all of these things negatively affect investors' appetites in getting involved in solar. So a smaller economy, for example, generally means there's a smaller market for energy. Uh, if there's a poor electricity grid, it could mean two things. First of all, it could mean that um, the quality of the grid is quite bad, which means a lot of electricity is lost in transit. But it could also mean that, few, that not many people are connected to the grid. So in Afghanistan, I think only 35% of people are connected to the grid. So obviously, again, there's a smaller market for energy. Uh, higher corruption can really affect the kind of building the infrastructure on the ground. If you imagine if you've got to pay labourers, they don't turn up. If you've got to get permission to use land, all of that's really hindered by, by higher corruption. And, and political risk and war generally really turns off kind of international investors because they don't want to get involved in regions like that. And really interestingly, um, currency has an effect on whether an international investor wants to get involved. So supposing I was an, an, an American investor wanting to get involved in Afghanistan, I'd have to convert my dollars to the Afghani currency in order to, to build, the, build the infrastructure. Um, and then I would get profits in the Afghani currency. And I'd have to transfer them back to dollars. Um, so if the, if the exchange rate is really volatile, that could affect the, the, the rate at which I transfer the profits back from the Afghani currency into dollars. And so what we see is countries like Afghanistan, where the currency isn't pegged to the US dollar, get less investment than countries like Morocco, Saudi Arabia, where the currency is pegged to the dollar. And, and the investors know that if the currency is pegged, then transferring their profits back, they're not necessarily going to lose less profit. So really quickly, I'm interested in the factors which affect the whole region. So take corruption, for example. Is that only preventing solar development in Afghanistan? Or does it hinder every man a country? And we can test this by gathering data. Um, so data for solar infrastructure and data for corruption, for example. And we can use statistics to see if there's an inverse correlation or not across the whole region. Um, and the objective of this is uh, to test all the factors, um, corruption, currency, the quality of the grid. And basically, in essence, the aim is to find whether there are any conditions which determine whether a country will have a successful transition to solar or not. And the results will tell us what a country like Afghanistan can do, uh, what they need to focus on to catch up with a country like Morocco. Do they need to get rid of corruption, most importantly, or is it to do with currency, or what's the priority? So I've not actually done the research yet. Uh, my dissertation is due in September, so I've not done the quantitative research, but um, that's my email address. If anyone's interested in the final results, then feel free to get in touch and I'll send you a copy. Uh, when it's completed. So thank you. Any questions?